and we are live. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Level Up Live. I am Dr. Sharita gaskins Tillette. I am your host, and this, this is Level Up Live, the show where we feature the amazing accomplishments of women physicians, both inside and outside of the exam room. And I have a really exciting guest for us this evening. Um, but before I introduce her, I just want to allow a few minutes for others to log on and um, remind you to say hi in the com to say hi. Um, you know, in the comments, ask us your questions. If you're watching the replay, hashtag replay, still ask your questions because I'll be happy to pass them along to our guests. I also want to remind you that registration is still open for a weekend for me, the premier wellness experience for professional women taking place November 2nd through 5th in Puerto Rico. And this retreat is going to be absolutely amazing. Um, I did a site visit a couple of weeks ago and it exceeded my expectations. And if anybody knows anything about me as an event planner, it is pretty hard to exceed my expectations, but it most definitely did. So I am super excited to be hosting an event at such a, a wonderful venue. And I have so much information I can't wait to impart to you guys. So www.aweekendforme.com to register. Registration is actually ending on Sunday. This coming Sunday, October 1st, is the last day to register. So if you're on the fence, please get off the fence. Go to www.aweekendforme.com to register now. So let's get going. I'm super excited to introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Susie Sharp. Dr. Susie is an internal medicine physician and an artist. Her work has been been exhibited in New York, Paris, Miami, Madrid, Brussels, and Luxembourg. Dr. Susie is also a TEDx speaker and has been featured on numerous podcasts and publications. Her TEDx talk is entitled Four Keys to Achieving Your Dreams, A Journey of a Physician Artist. So welcome, Dr. Susie. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. So now tell us, I'd like to start by um, having you take us through your journey in medicine. And I know that yours is a somewhat unique journey. So, so tell us, did you always want to be a physician? And how did you come to, to be a doctor? So I grew up in Korea. Actually, my initial dream was to become an artist. But when I was 16, my parents decided to immigrate to the US. I didn't speak any English, neither of my parents. So although they were professionals in Korea, when we landed here, we became struggling immigrants. I realized that if I pursue art, there was no certainty that I could even support myself. So I, I felt I needed to find a different career path. And medicine looked like it could be an impossible dream, but something that is well-defined that if I just follow through, maybe, yeah. maybe someday it's possible. And I also wanted to find a field where I could help people direct way. So okay. after many grueling years of uh, schooling, uh, I got my MD and residency training from Yale, and I started practicing in Seattle in internal medicine practice. Okay. So you wanted to be an artist, <laughs> but you ended up being a doctor because it seemed to be, um, I guess, a safer, you know, more stable career, if you will. Um, so now you're now an artist in addition to being a physician so tell me how did you make that transition so i've had a very busy fulfilling career but um i had a couple of wake-up calls that made me really think about it one is i've lost three partners to a burnout and they were mm -hmm. wonderful female internists well respected and beloved by patients, but uh, they ended up leaving medicine permanently. And I felt like I would be the next person because uh, by then I was, this is about 16 years or so into my practice. Okay. And, uh, and then the second wake up call was, I was in a near car accident one day after a long day in the clinic. And what I meant by long day was more like 18 plus hours in the clinic. Wow. In the clinic? And, yeah, in the clinic. <laughs> in the wow. Clinic. And all of us worked like that, which is why we ended up you know, having burnout. But um, when I had a near accident, it made me realize that if I had died then, I would have never got to live my original dream as an artist. 
so it made me realize that I have to revive this and somehow make it work. And uh, so those two wake up calls made me realize I have to incorporate art. And uh, and when I went back to medicine after a period of burnout and um, a break, I, to my surprise, I rediscovered the joy of practicing medicine again. So it's mm. been wonderful doing both. Well, you know, I've actually, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of physician women and I, and that's a, a common sentiment that people feel like after they are able to take a, a little time away from medicine, that they mm -hmm. actually can enjoy practicing it more, um, you mm -hmm. know, when they return, you know, just mm -hmm. having that break helps to alleviate some of the burnout that people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. So but I didn't see that initially. I thought uh, when I left medicine just now years ago, I thought I would never go back to medicine, that I, I was so burned out, um, I just couldn't see myself in there. But uh, to my surprise, <laughs> I was able to really enjoy medicine again afterwards. So I, I think that I want people to know that don't close that, that door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now tell me, when you say you were burned out, what kind of things were you experiencing? What, what were the feelings? Just total physical exhaustion. Um, and I had one partner who would come in five in the morning, do three, four hours of chart work before starting patient wow. care. Um, I had another partner who actually brought in a mattress to her office, lived there for a year, okay, before her burnout. Um, and for me, it was, um, you know, working 12 plus hours a day in the clinic, come back, take care of the kids, drive to all their kids' activities, okay, and then start doing the chart work again, say about 11 o'clock at night till about, two o'clock routinely. Wow. Okay. Um, and then be back in the clinic the next day. So, so there's literally no time for you whatsoever. There was no time for me. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. And so you had these wake up calls and you decided that it was time to pursue your dreams. You did not want to die with your dreams inside of you, but tell Correct. me, how did you make that pivot? Because, you know, this schedule sounds almost impossible that you were mm -hmm. living. Yet somehow mm -hmm. you made space for your dream. So tell tell me a little about that. So I started to stop doing the chart work about maybe midnight and then do a few hours of painting from midnight to about three o'clock in the morning. Oh, and wow. so a lot of my earlier paintings were done all past midnight. OK, and then get a few hours of sleep and then back in the clinic. Um, I did that for a while. And then when I went back, I chose a different type of practice where it was fixed hours, salary position, so that I didn't have to worry so much about the overhead. Previous position, the overhead was 75%. So mm -hmm. we worked nine months out of the year just to pay the overhead. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is one of the things that I want to tell younger physicians that when you take on a position that is uh, production-based, and we were thriving in the production base by numbers, but right. um, there isn't that added pressure. Okay. And, you know, absolutely. Yeah, even without the pressure, you know, we physicians, we work hard anyway. Yes. So we don't need that extra pressure. So I chose a salary position that gave me more, um, more no, limited hours and then real time off so that um, I wasn't on call, you know, overnight and, and had a pager and, and weekends and so on. So that gave me more freedom. Mm -hmm. So you've always wanted to be an artist. You said that was your dream. Did you mm -hmm. study art at some point or are you mostly self-taught? So I did some during pre-med, but very limited, okay? And then after that wake up call, I started taking art classes whenever I could, um, uh, online or in person, whenever I could. And then a lot of it is self-taught. Okay, so now, you know, you're, you've exhibited your work around the world at this point, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I applaud you for that. But how did you come from painting in your house to exhibiting in Paris? <laughs> like, who, who saw your paintings and said, okay, this is really good work, and we're going to take this around the world? Well, uh, 
initially it didn't start like that. Initially, I joined local art group, artist groups and start doing group shows with them. And then at some point, I had a courage to do a solo show. So, so say 10, 20 pieces of my work. And, and then eventually I was doing so many shows that I ran out of place to do. I've done it in every local venues. And around that time, I got discovered online by a gallery in Madrid who invited mm-hmm. me to a show at, um, and to the International Art Fair. And I did one, and then it went well, and then uh, I kept just kept on doing more. Uh-oh. And so it's been it's been quite an experience, and all while seeing patients at the same time. So um, they, I think, the medicine and art really help each other. Yes, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of people talk about living your dream life, and you know, for us physicians, a lot of our dream life is you know it involves more than medicine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of years, I think that we've been viewed as one dimensional people when, in Mm -hmm. fact, you know, we are we are multi talented and have many Mm -hmm. dimensions. And in Mm -hmm. order to to live a fulfilling life, um, I think it's important that we explore some of these other gifts and talents Mm -hmm. that lie inside of us. Mm -hmm. So I think it's awesome that you're you're doing this now with the art. So tell tell me what's what's next, as I know you've been to all these different places. What is your, is this your big dream? Are you living it now or is there more? So I still want to reach more people with my art because I have distinct message uh, behind each painting. And um, so I want to go further with my art. And then I also, at some point, I'll write a memoir okay, mm-hmm. and have a chance to share my story more in depth. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what does mm-hmm. what does art mean to you? You said there's a story behind each of your pieces, but what does art mean to you? So as physicians, you know, we see a lot of human suffering, as, yes. especially as an internist. You know, I've had patients with chronic diseases, uh, chronic pain, uh, cancer, debilitating depression, anxiety, death. And, you know, we see all that. And so I really want to highlight the beautiful side of life because otherwise Mm -hmm. most of news that we hear are so negative and so depressing and we could be just overwhelmed by that and I want people to see there there is still a beautiful side of life and so my colors are intentionally very bright and vibrant Uh, and at the same time I also want people to feel Oh, the freedom that mm-hmm. that I came to experience, and um, and so my technique is very spontaneous and liberating. And I I, I started with doing very uh, represent representational art, very precise, but mm-hmm. I gradually broke away from it because you know what we do as a physician is very precise and analytical, yeah. and we can't deviate from that. But I want my art to be liberating. Um, so now it's very abstract. It's very fluid. Um, I can't never reproduce my piece exactly because you have to be in that moment. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like it helps you to balance, really, mm-hmm. to find right. balance. You know, between the all of the negative in the world and to bring some joy and some light um, mm-hmm. to to the situation. So do you um, share your art with other physicians? Yes. uh, Actually, many of my patrons are wounded physicians around the globe. I've had people reached out for me from Europe and from Asia and and across the country. And uh, so many of them are female physicians. I share them with physicians and I share them with many many other people um, who appreciate my art. Mm-hmm. So let's see some of your art. If I can get this to, to do what I needed to do, you're going to share some of your paintings with us. Okay. So tell us about this piece. This is titled Joy of Music. I'm a musician. I play the piano. Uh, I am passionate about music, and 
this just i think brings up so much joy in people it's colorful it's it's free it's a free form so i want people to feel that love of music that i feel <laughs> through that piece it is very vibrant <laughs> and beautiful i love the colors okay and then this next one let's see are you able to see that yes uh, okay. no wait see okay hold on i may need to stop sharing the other one first yeah, I think I have to share them one by one. I can't switch between the screens. That's okay. Okay. Now, tell us about this piece. So, this is the violin. And of all the music instruments, uh, I'm most passionate about violin. I taught both of my kids violin for years. Uh, and... Uh, I personally think that this is violin is the most beautiful man-made instrument. So I wanted to depict that. Mm -hmm. So did you play violin before you came to the U.S.? You know, my first instrument was piano. Okay, but I didn't start violin till late in high school. So I'm obviously not very good at all. Okay, and so I wanted my kids to start when they're little, like you know, three years old, four years old. And they became quite good. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. I just wondered, I asked that because, you know, I wondered how your music, because you came not speaking English, I mm -hmm. wondered how your music um, maybe helped to um, give you a safe space when you arrived here. Yeah. You know, um, during high school, I was a church pianist and that oh. gave me a little bit of an escape. Uh -huh. Yes. So my pastor was sitting in the middle of a sermon and it was my job to find the exact key transposed to whatever <laughs> key it was and start playing that you know, gospel music and so on. So that was an excellent ear training, by the way. And then well, and, you started, know, and that provided that the pastor actually sang on a key because I've seen <laughs> it happen. <laughs> <laughs> the musician is trying, struggling to find a key, and somehow that note that they're singing is in between. <laughs> and so, so kudos to um, you. You know, even now, I mean, you know, gospel music, the hymns, those are kind of second nature. I could probably play in my sleep. Huh? And then when I went to college, I still spoke very little English, and I was uh, away from home for the first time, totally homesick, not knowing anybody. And I would go to chapel and just cry my heart out mm. playing the piano because I was so lonely and just in despair. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get through this? I'm in this elite college with uh, with kids who came from very privileged background. Yes. Here I was, poor immigrant, not speaking English in, in this elite college. How, you know? So I would cry my heart out playing the music. And so it helped me get through some tough times. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, very safe space for you. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we got a couple more here. Okay, how about this one? Oh, these are from my Heroes series. The first uh, one I recognize these guys. Yeah, he's a big name coach uh, who has helped a lot of people. And then uh, JFK, okay, and Dr. King, obviously, okay, another one of my heroes. And then uh, Bill Gates, who is who I admire so much as a Phil, you know philanthropist yes who's done so much work mm -hmm. now you mentioned philanthropy um i think i recall reading that the proceeds from your art goes to charity mm -hmm. is that correct yeah all my proceeds after my expenses go to uh, charities uh, especially to uh, to schools that educate girls in africa mm -hmm. ah okay mm -hmm. all right why that why are those in particular I feel pretty strongly about empowering girls, uh, educating the girls. When you empower girls, 
we could make a bigger impact in a faster way. Um, yeah. They are the ones who tend to raise kids and and we have a better chance of breaking the you know, cycle of poverty when you invest in girls. So I feel pretty strong about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And then especially in those countries too, where mm -hmm. women tend to be oppressed. Mm -hmm. So you're right, right. that's a, a really powerful initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, how about this one? Um, I find wine bottles just really beautiful. I'm not a big wine drinker. I love wine, but you know, if I get like few sips, I'm already done. I'm like <laughs> ready to pass out. But yes, I find I the bottle. <laughs> but you know, I, I just find those so beautiful. So I wanted to illustrate. I have a whole series for wine lovers. <laughs> okay. So a lot of you, so your series, you, you said you have wine lovers, you have music lovers. Mm -hmm. What are the, what are, what are your series? Um, I have ocean lovers. Uh, we have one for the ocean too. Mm -hmm. Let me find that one. I remember seeing that. So ocean lovers, wine lovers, music lovers. So this one, tell us about this piece. It's called Big Wave. Um, it is gone to one of the female physicians who I met online. In fact, most of my paintings go to female physicians who I meet online, actually. And um, it's a large piece. Uh, and I, I love the ocean. It, you know, my Ocean Lovers uh, series was started during the early pan pandemic. And mm -hmm. I'm used to traveling, and I was really missing the ocean, yet couldn't travel anywhere. And so I've created a few pieces that are ocean theme and it just went wild. It just became one of the most popular series. So I kept on producing more. So even now, um, that's probably the series that I create the most. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the series you create the most. Mm -hmm. Which of your series do you love the most? You know, it's hard to say. It's like, uh, which children do you love the most? Yes. Which, which <laughs> the one you're you talking love? to right now, right? <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. each one of my paintings, I like, uh, like my children. Okay. And so uh, initially, it was very hard to let go. Just like it's hard to let go of kids yeah. when they go to college. It was just very, very hard to let go. Because I put my heart and soul into each piece. But I realized just like you know, letting go of children, they need to go and do their pursue their life. I have to let go of my peace so that that it brings joy to to, to others. It, it it does what it's supposed to do is to uh, yes. send a message. Mm -hmm. So how do you know when it's finished? I've always wondered that with artists because it seems like you can always add another brush stroke or or something. How how do you know when you finished a piece? I think I intuitively know there are times when I did too much and then that I, but at some point you need to have that confidence that it is done. Um, so is it, is it more of a feeling inside you looking say, okay, you have a piece about mm -hmm. it or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, though, not all my pieces are successful and that some of the most difficult challenge is is what do you do with the piece that is pretty good, but not great? So mm. if it's obviously a, a failed piece, that's easy. Or paint over or something or toss or something like that. But something that's pretty good, uh, what do you do with that? Because it's not good enough to present, um, say, to somebody or uh, for a show. Mm -hmm. And it takes the courage to say, okay, I'm not going to settle with something that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. So even if my next attempt over it may not be as good, okay, I might regret it. But <laughs> I think that you got to be willing to fail. Okay. In medicine, you can't do that. I think, you know, you, in medicine, you have to be so much more careful and precise. Right. In art, always striving for I've perfection. Gotta, yeah, yes. I've got to break away from that. I've got to be willing to fail so that I have a chance to cre create something that's, you know, what I think is spectacular. Yeah. Right. 
But I think to mm -hmm. being able to take those chances, you know, being willing to mm -hmm. fail, I think it helps us to grow. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, and right. I think one of the one of the problems that we have, in, you know, with medicine is because it's so precise and because perfection is always, um, you know, always, you know, we're always striving to be perfect because there's very little room for error. I think it makes us rigid. And it, it, you know, it doesn't allow us to to bloom and blossom into the fullness of the person that we were meant to be. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. It's just it's yeah, very I'm, hard because we're trained to be uh, that analytical and precise, that perfectionist all the time. And to switch out of that to a different side, it's uh, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is not. <laughs> it is not. So now you did a TEDx talk. Tell mm -hmm. us um, about that process. What made you decide to do a TEDx talk? Mm -hmm. And what did you talk about? So I got invited to many podcasts and, and I really enjoyed it. And then I've had a, many people reached out to me uh, telling me about how my story gave them hope they, to go for something that seemed impossible. Um, and so after having so many people reached out to me from the podcast, I felt I needed to share my message with a larger audience. And then I realized if I waited until I felt comfortable and ready, it would never happen. Uh, it's hard enough for a native speaker to do it. For yeah. someone like me, I'm still learning English. Uh, and so I felt that I just had to jump in and do it. And so I used this model that I applied to a lot of times, which is you decide, you then commit, and then you figure out how. <laughs> you don't you don't start with, okay, knowing all the answers, because if I'd done that, I could not have done half the things that I did. Right. If I waited until I had the answers. Um, so I made a decision, <laughs> I committed, and then, and then I, uh, then I applied to places, and I was fortunate uh, enough to get into actually three places. And so I gave a tech talk in uh, University of Washington, Seattle, this past spring, in the middle of my move. And again, oh, if you wow. wait for the perfect timing, it just it will never come. Never come. <laughs> it, it may not ever come. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah. So what did you talk about in your in your TEDx talk? So it's uh, four keys to achieving your dream, but it's more than just four kids. It's, it's really overcoming obstacles and not mm -hmm. giving up. And so, you know, my, one of my heroes that in fact, I still want to paint is Nelson Mandela. And I have mm -hmm. a wall full of the quotation from him. And uh, he said something like, do not judge me by my success. Judge me by how many times I fell down and still got up. And yeah. So, you know, I try to have all these historical figures inspire me on a, my day-to-day -day life. Yes. And I noticed in your talk, you have a number of quotes and I can't remember, I'm not remembering the last quote, but the last quote, I was really struck by the person you quoted. And I can't remember what your, what your closing quote was. I'm sure I'll remember after we, we finished mm -hmm. talking. Um, but I was just the the um, the breadth of people that you quote. I was impressed mm -hmm. <laughs> that you studied so many, um, you know, so many great thinkers. Mm -hmm. yeah, so to me, you know, they're not historical figures. They are almost living beings. I almost almost feel like I'm having conversation. They're my like personal coaches. Um, yes. So I, I feel privileged that my life overlap a little bit with some of these, my heroes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it's important that we take time to glean those um, lessons and those messages from them, you know, and, and, and figure out how we can apply it to our own lives. Mm -hmm. So now if people are interested in purchasing some of your art or seeing more of your art, where can they find you? On my website, which is uh, my first name, last name, dot net. So Susie Sharp dot net. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I like to end each interview with a variation of the same question. 
And so for you, my question would be, if I am a professional woman looking to up level my um, my creativity, my joy, my happiness, what is the single best thing that I can do? I would say a common theme that I see in even the most successful women is uh, is imposter syndrome. Mm. I think uh, we want to find a way to overcome that because, you know, say I think about one study that um, that was done at Cornell University that said that males tend to overestimate their uh, yes. performance. And the female tends to underestimate when, in fact, there was no actual difference in performance. And so, and the other thing I constantly remind myself is that a study that showed men tend to apply for a job if they feel that if they meet 60% of qualification, yes. whereas we tend to wait until we meet all 100%. Yes. And then even so, we still have self-doubt. So I think knowing that our tendency it will help us to, to overcome imposter syndrome. Yeah, no, you're right. Imposter syndrome is a huge issue. You know, but one of the things I like to tell people is that the only people who feel imposter syndrome are the people who are actually qualified. <laughs> you yes, know, the unqualified you know. don't feel imposter mm -hmm. syndrome. They just, you know, they mm -hmm. just go out here and, and do and say whatever it is they think they need to do and say. But, mm -hmm. you know, those who are actually qualified um, are the ones who take the time to think about it and, and feel like maybe they don't have everything that they need. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but you're right. It's important for us as women to take chances and to, you know, battle against the imposter syndrome and to change the, the way that we speak to ourselves and tell ourselves that we can do it and we are qualified and we do have something to offer the world. So, mm -hmm. again, I, I applaud you for, um, you know, putting all this beauty out into the world and for daring your fears and pursuing your dream and being an inspiration to the rest of us. So thank you so, so much for coming on this evening. Thanks I appreciate for having you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it for tonight, guys. Um, the information for Dr. Uh, Susie is in the comments. If you want to check out more of her work, if you have questions for her, definitely put them in the comments and I will pass them along. So I will see you all next week for Level Up Live. And again, registration is open until Sunday, October 1st for A Weekend For Me, www.aweekendforme.com. Please don't hesitate to reach out by DM or um, you know other means if you have questions for me. So take care, have a great night. Thank you again, Dr. Susie. Thank you. Mm -hmm.